Hi, I'm Paul Brazell, and I'm also a licensed clinical social worker. Hello, I'm Kathleen Phelps. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. My background in social work started working with what we called the chronically mentally ill. Once I'm li I was licensed, I went to work at Kaiser Permanente for 16 years. Currently, I have a private practice where I still work with folks with eating disorders and other health issues, including chronic pain as it relates to trauma. My work experience following my graduate program here at SDSU back in 2000 when I graduated included working in a residential treatment center, working with foster kids and their families, and also as a school social worker for the last 15 years. Hello and welcome to the 2019 MSW orientation. We're really excited to be with you today and talk about cultural humility, cultural diversity, implicit bias, and intersectionality. We want to create a safe place today to talk about diversity among ourselves and with our clients. We acknowledge that we are two Caucasian professors in the field of social work, but we hope that today is just the start of our conversations about our differences. We wholeheartedly welcome courageous conversation about cultural humility. We ask that you listen to this video with the intent to learn more about yourself, as well as learning more about other people that you will be with in the classroom as well as in the field. We have several learning objectives for you today. First, we want to have you increase your self-awareness of any possible biases that we may have and how that relates to culture and better understanding diversity with ourselves and also with our colleagues and clients. We also want to review the important theory of implicit bias and we want to define intersectionality. What's the difference between cultural humility and cultural competence? They both sound so similar. We're going to discuss the difference here. In addition to that, what does it mean to have privilege? And how does that affect us as social workers? We're going to have a series of questions and a couple of vignettes as well for you to stop and take some time and think critically about how those vignettes and your potential clients may be affecting you and vice versa. I'd like to talk about implicit bias with you. Unlike explicit bias, which reflects the attitudes and beliefs that one endorses at a conscious level, implicit bias is a bias in judgment or behavior that results from subtle cognitive processes, such as implicit attitudes or behaviors towards someone that's different from yourself. These often operate at a level that's below consciousness or awareness or even intentionality. These biases are automatically activated by the mere presence, actual or symbolic, of someone that's different from ourselves. It might be a different group, it might be a different skin color, it might be the way someone's dressing. These biases are developed over time and are often correlated with our primary caregivers and maybe even an accumulation of personal experiences. Intersectionality is the critical insight that race, class, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, nationality, ability, and age operate not as unitary or mutually exclusive entities, but rather as a reciprocally constructing phenomena that in turn shapes complex inequalities. This suggests that even when you can understand a specific category of difference in a person or their diversity, 
that category is impacted in unique ways by other diverse categories, showing us the complexity of humans and in their overlapping identities. As social workers, this is very important to us to not look at people just one lens at a time. We all make up many different things from different cultural beliefs, religious beliefs. If I were to look at all of my clients through one lens, through their gender, through their religious beliefs, for example, that wouldn't give me the whole picture of who they are. And it wouldn't let me know what their motivations are regarding what their behaviors are. So what's the difference between cultural humility and cultural competence? Cultural competence is a mastery of a finite body of knowledge. Simply put, if you read a chapter, if you read a book on a particular ethnicity, a particular religion, you know all about that religion, for example. And that's not true. As social workers, we need a continuing lifelong learning of sorts regarding culture and cultural humility is just that. It's really admitting we don't know everything there is about every culture and it's committing ourselves to learning more and more, to finding out how our culture affects our clients because we see each culture, each value, each belief through a different lens. We need to take that all into consideration as social workers. Here we have two videos that we would like you to review before we come back for our MSW orientation. The first video is from a woman by the name of Dr. Mosley, who's the College Officer for Diversity and Inclusion at Chestnut Hill College in Philadelphia. The second video is a video of several professionals talking about the very beginnings of the idea of cultural humility. So how does culture affect our practice as social workers and how does it affect us personally? First, it defines how information is received. When we give our clients information, how do they hear it? How do they see their symptoms? Do they see them as symptoms? We may call them that, they may not see them as that. And how or why may a a person choose a specific person to go to as an authority, as their social worker. Everyone has a different support system and that can be made of people from their culture and their community. This really affects how we build rapport with our clients as well as our coworkers and why that may or may not be there if there are any barriers. So next, we have some discussion questions for you to consider. I encourage you to pause the video after I ask these questions so that you can take the time to reflect on them. The first question is how do we know what a client thinks about us or how they perceive us? What might they think about our own culture and why would that matter? The second question is how do our fellow social workers, colleagues think about us? How do they perceive our culture and why would that matter? How would we go about assessing our clients and our coworkers thoughts about our own culture? So we've come to our first vignette where I will present the vignette to you and Professor Brazell and I will be asking you some questions. We are hoping that you can stop and pause and think critically if you were in this situation, how might you handle this? The situation is this. You are a hospital social worker. And the family of a hospital patient begins using cultural healing practices unknown to the medical staff and unknown to you as the hospital social worker. So here are some questions to, con to consider following this vignette. What diverse beliefs, values, minority status, or customs 
might be operating in this situation that might help explain or clarify the client's behavior or choices. Another question to consider is what individual, family, or cultural strengths might be identified in these situations. Different cultures might respond differently to healing. Maybe some include more family members, and maybe for some it's more of an individual treatment. How might these situations be misunderstood if you aren't familiar with these customs of healing? Perhaps if you are a hospital social worker, you might see things through the medical model. If the doctor gives you orders to ask the patient to do X, Y, Z, or your particular discharge planning involves only X, Y, Z, you might not be familiar with what this, this client or their family is doing. What additional information or skills would you need to be competent in this situation? If you aren't familiar, how can you go about becoming familiar or uh, gaining more information regarding this practice? Perhaps asking the patient or the family themselves. You can certainly ask your supervisor, do case consultation. For example, if you need an interpreter, if there's a different language being spoken as well, to be able to invite an interpreter in to the situation with your uh, patient and their family. What does it mean to have privilege in the context of being a social worker? When do we have privilege and when do we not? I think having privilege or just even the word privilege, we think we know what it means, but in order for us to all have the same definition and understanding, let me provide the definition that we're going to use. One definition is it's a set of unearned benefits given to people who fit into a specific social group. Some examples of this may be if you grew up where you didn't have to worry about money, perhaps you were financially comfortable or even wealthy, perhaps you had health insurance growing up, perhaps you were Caucasian or heterosexual or English is your first language. Those might be some examples of privilege. For our purposes in the social work program, we need to recognize that some of our clients believe that we have privilege just because of our role as a social worker. Let me give you some examples. If you're an intern that's working within the prison system, the fact that you're free and can make choices on a day-to-day -day basis shows that you have privilege. Perhaps you're a child welfare worker and you're helping families make decisions, you're again showing that you have privilege. If you don't have to think about privilege, then you have it. We will continue our conversation about privilege at our orientation. We will have an exercise where we provide you some vignettes and have you talk about, with a partner or in a small group, about your self-awareness with cultural humility, cultural diversity, and privilege. We will also discuss how to use privilege to your clients or your colleagues' advantage. So again, this is our vignette that we want you to listen to, perhaps take some notes, hitting the pause button, and really critically think about bringing that into the orientation itself where we will discuss all of this. The situation is this. Students are discussing in their practice class about clients who have a mental illness and are homeless. One male Caucasian student asks, why are there more black people that are homeless than white people? I see more of them on the streets. A female African-American student responded with, who says there are more black homeless people? You're just a racist. So some questions for discussion. First of all, what are the factors at play with each of these two students' remarks? What do you think is behind the questions or comments from each? Some things to consider. 
are their own backgrounds, implicit biases, some of the other things we may have mentioned in this video so far. Would it matter to you if the student asking the first question were black and the second student were Caucasian or Latino? Would that matter? Why or why not? We would also like for you to consider whether or not you would be comfortable saying anything in this situation. Why or why not? We'd also like for you to consider how the professor might respond in a situation like this. Thank you so much for partaking in this conversation about culture. We want to remind you that this is just the beginning conversations that we'll be having. These will continue in our orientation and these will continue in our field seminar courses. We look forward to meeting you all and having these continued conversations, not only at orientation, but throughout your time here.